Okay, we're ready to get started. Call the meeting to order. Stephanie, you're here. You're up first, as I promised. I have the uh, budget status report for the fund on uh, 1148. Okay. For the 2022 budget, uh, the there it's uh, line items are zero dollars. Um, the the money from this year, whatever is not spent, uh, rolls over into 2022. Plus the uh, the revenues from this year that's collected from um, court fees, a percentage of that goes into this fund. And then the LCC Council, um, approves grants that are submitted. And here is the plan that is for um, the Criminal Justice Institute. And starting with we set up SMART goals, what our needs are for the county, and then um, starting at step five, you'll see our problem statements. And then over to the right, you'll see each fund that corresponds with our fund, each fund line item, prevention and education, treatment and intervention and criminal justice and so we take the total of what carries over for 2022 our our remaining balance from 2021 the year to date revenues we take that ending balance and we split that between the four categories So at, at this time to, to uh, appropriate the funds, um, well, usually the, the budget at the starting of the year doesn't really fluctuate that much. So I requested the 16751 and uh, for each category. Those funds that are collected, um, oh, they fall in the guidelines of what's submitted to the Criminal Justice Institute. There's uh, additional problem statements on the next page, and then the categories that uh, receive those funds. Uh, this year, so far, we've assisted um, the area schools with funds for Red Ribbon Week activities and also with uh, promotionals, um, prizes, contests, and uh, to show the kids um, drug and alcohol prevention education. We've also um, supported the Hamilton Center with uh, relapse prevention workbooks to assist those um, that are out of the treatment program, but that are going to outpatient services or meetings and that sort of thing that help those individuals to prevent relapse. We've also assisted the sheriff's office um, with National Night Out um, for the uh, activities, uh, promotionals, contract services. Um, we've also assisted the Rockville Police Department with funds for uh, tobacco 
education, underage purchasing of tobacco products, and um, the this year. We, oh, we've also assisted the schools with um, the vaping speaker to come and for, a, uh, for all the schools to hear the speaker on uh, vaping and um, education and prevention of, of that within the schools. We've assisted the schools with um, detectors uh, to so at one point there was a lot of vaping in the schools. The detectors help um, identify when someone is vaping in the restrooms. And then they've worked with um, the judge on uh, getting help to prevent vaping. And so I, um, I just, here to re request um, that the funds for the 2022 budget um, in the amount of the $16,751 um, be appropriated for the 2022 budget in each category of prevention, treatment, justice, and the discretionary contractual services. <clears throat> um, I have a few questions, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, who's on this? Who's on the LCC council? The council is made up in that plan that I gave you. Um, the, within the first few pages, uh, those are the council members, are the people that have been at, that have participated in the council. It doesn't mean that they attend all the meetings. But the majority of the attendees are a representative from the Sheriff's Office, a representative from the Rockville Police Department, a representative from the Montezuma Police Department, area school counselors, a representative from Hamilton Center, and a representative from Valley Professionals. Okay and probation and drug court. Um, and you said the funding source is fines from, collected from where, from, I mean, what, what kind of fines are we talking about here? Those are arrests that are made related to drug and alcohol. A percentage of that, those fines uh, go to this fund, mm -hmm. the 1148 fund. Okay. And then in, in conjunction with that, the Criminal Justice Institute out of Indianapolis uh, requires that the coordinator of the county council uh, report to them, uh, develop a plan, which is an annual plan. There are quarterly reports that are submitted in addition to an annual report of our uh, the goals that have been met, and then we submit our minutes to them, and uh, they, our quarterly report also lists the applications that have been submitted and what um, problem statement that, that that relates to and which category uh, those grant requests are funded from. Okay. Uh, do you know why the budget was adopted at zero? At, at zero? Yes. Okay. Um, the reason to make sure so the others know is that we had asked, requested this information at the budget hearings, and um, the materials, the request was turned in late, and then uh, nobody showed from the LCC. Uh, at their appointed time or the rest of the day. So uh, any other department is pretty much full aware that if they don't 
provide their information and they don't show up, that they're very liable to get a zero budget and forced to come in and ask for it to be done in its additional appropriations, which is what this is. Um, you've answered the rest of the questions that I would have asked you then in your, in your talk of where does it go, what's it used for. Um, these are things that I felt like I personally, and I think some of the, several of the other members feel like it's important to understand um, of what goes on with this, where the money comes from, where it goes. Um, but that's why, and you know why it happened, and uh, it can be dealt with in January. And um, but yeah, it's we important that you understand that when we ask for ask for it. I mean, there's there's reasons why it happens, but there was never any communication as to why. Uh, nobody came, so. So what we'll do, uh, we can't act on it today. Uh, we will uh, ask the auditor to do an addition, advertise an additional uh, in January, and we'll deal with it in our January meeting. So all will be righted then once we vote on it in January. I don't think there's going to be any objections now. But from now on, why we need to make this part of the budget process, but okay. because if this were to happen again, we can ask the other departments then that, you know, we'll always fix it for you, but we'll fix it this time. But, okay. uh, and you can ask any of these other people that are sitting back here that have to do budgets. They, timeliness is important here, and mm -hmm. it has to be adhered to. Our, we have deadlines ourselves, and when we're held up by others that don't turn their work in, why it becomes a problem for us. And it puts the auditor in a bad position as well. So we will take care of it in January, mm -hmm. and you should be good to go. Okay. We Do thank I you for coming. To? Do I need to re request anything for the January meeting? No. no. We'll take care of it. We'll take we care have your request that you turned in for your budget. So okay. we'll take care that's of all it. you need in the matter of order. Yeah, that's all I need. Yeah. So you don't have to come in January or anything. We'll okay. take care of it. And it's merely a paperwork shuffle on our end. So. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you for the time. Yeah, thanks. Cindy, you want to introduce your guests? Your joint? Sure. Um, just as a quick thing, um, as you know, the Park County Broadband Ready Committee's been working heavily with the providers um, that are fortunately providing some additional expanded services in Park County. So um, as a committee, we've, as I said, been working with providers. Um, the state of Indiana has the Next Level Connections Broadband Grant and we worked with Joint in a previous round in identifying some project areas that were awarded. There were five of those that they're working on pretty hard. Um, so three of those, I think, are at least pretty close. Um, so we're in the third round now of the Next Level Broadband Connection Grant, and um, again, working with, with the providers to identify some project areas. So. Uh, Josh Warner and Jack Mc Jackie McDowell from Joint are here today uh, to present some project areas that they've identified for this round and also to ask for some consideration from the ARP funding. Um, if we could leverage that to assist in the matching part of these grants to help make the application more competitive. So I will let Josh take over from there and you're welcome to come up here if that's easier. And <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to also, also introduce Mackenzie Counts. Mackenzie is with RJL Solutions out of Terre Haute. RJL is um, functioning as an extension of joint and helping us pursue these grants. They were instrumental in the last uh, seven Next Level Connect grants that we won from the state of Indiana. So Mackenzie is a subject matter expert in uh, OCRA and state of Indiana grant projects, among other things. So, thank you. So, well, Jackie's our Jackie is our Vice President of Operations, so Jackie has responsibility over all aspects of our construction crews and um, everything from currently sales to uh, customer satisfaction over time, the entire customer lifetime at Joint. So we're happy to be here today. I appreciate you putting us on the agenda to meet with you. So we, we uh, began uh, fiber construction in 2014. Um, we have built fiber throughout a five-county area of West Central Indiana, uh, so that's Vigo, Vermilion, Park, Clay, and Sullivan County. Um, we've always enjoyed working in Park County. We appreciate uh, the, your support of our initiatives here. Our network was initially built uh, through Park County as, as part of <coughs> connecting uh, 
some anchor tenants primarily in the healthcare space. Um, and we've since used that network and expanded upon that network to service small and medium businesses as well as residential customers. Um, Joint is currently in the process of, of um, pivoting. I think it's an overused phrase, but uh, I think it's an appropriate phrase in that uh, we, we started in 2001 providing service using fixed wireless technologies. In 2014, we started <coughs> using fiber technologies to meet the needs of our largest customers, our enterprise customers. Uh, and now we're kind of going full circle and we're using our fiber optic network to provide residential service. So um, it's, it's a big switch for us to get ready to um, service <coughs> residential customers, both in terms of the capital that we're <coughs> and, and the change in the size and scale of our operation. Uh, we're very pleased. Um, we issued a, an announcement earlier this week that we have a, a new investor partner that uh, will provide us access to continued growth capital to make sure that we have enough money to, to be able to swing at, at fiber to the home and scale <coughs> across the five county area. And so that's a really uh, neat announcement. Um, but it's, the way we think about it in the industry is we think about it as homes per road mile. And, and we use that as concept of density. Uh, so there are parts of Terre Haute where there are 150 residents per road mile, and that's because they're in apartment complexes, for example. And then the next bucket we think about is 100 to 150 households per road mile, and 75 to 100, 50 to 75, 25 to 50. When you start getting below 50 households per road mile, it's not commercially viable uh, to build fiber to the home. And <coughs> if we take a piece of paper out and we talk about the cost per mile to build fiber, and we look at only having five to 10 homes on that house that are gonna pay 60 to $70 a month. Our, our starting package price is $69, we call it $70 a month. Uh, if you spend $60,000 to build a mile of fiber and you're collecting uh, five customers at $70 a month or $350 a month for service, it's a 60 year payback period. No investor in the right money to make those investments. And so we're very fortunate to be doing business in Indiana uh, because Indiana and the leadership in Indiana has set aside a substantial amount of money to bridge that gap. And so there is grant funding available to fund up to 80% of the construction costs to extend fiber service to homes that are otherwise not served. And so the, uh, the, the process is such that you submit a letter of intent underneath the Indiana Next Level Connections Program, and in that letter of intent you list all of the addresses uh, that you'd like to serve, and then over time, um, you go back with a full application to service those addresses. And so in this particular case, the full application is due the first week of January. And part of the selection criteria underneath the Indiana Next Level Connections Program is, is how much of a match is being provided to state money. Um, and, and so I'm here today because I think there's an opportunity to demonstrate to the state uh, how much local support there is um, by Park County contributing a portion of those matching dollars to the grant. In the last uh, round of Next Level that we participated in, in the seven projects that we won, um, matching percentages by other applicants far exceeded the minimum 20% match. Um, and so I would encourage Park County, both the council and the commissioners, to consider providing as much matching dollars as you're comfortable uh, to increase the odds of us being able to win state support uh, to extend broadband to these homes that are eligible. The, the thing I can commit to you is that not only has Joint already made a substantial investment in Park County, uh, but that we will make this network available to anyone that we pass, and we're making our current network available to anyone that we pass. So in this particular opportunity, um, there are 118 eligible homes in Park County that are eligible under the grant. But what is significant to me is that when building to those 118 homes, we'll pass 409 homes along the way uh, with just these new routes that are being added. And those, those 409 homes are within 100 feet of the network. And under Joint's current operating parameters, uh, the installation fee is only $250 for a home within 100 feet of the network. Past 100 feet, we have a price per foot that we charge. 
Uh, and so there's 356 homes within 101 to 200 feet, and there's 268 homes between 201 and 300 feet. So there are really 1,033 homes within a reasonable distance of the routes that we would be constructing on our way to these 118 eligible homes. The, the minimum match is 20%. Um, my suggestion, based on a review of past applications and how, um, how much demand I think there will be for this money, I think it would make sense to try to uh, come up with a 35% match. In other words, we'd be asking the state to fund 65% of the construction costs. We, we estimate this uh, entire project cost to be approximately $7 million. And um, when, we, when we net that, net that out by percentages, um, I think it would make sense for the county to match somewhere between one and $2 million underneath this application with joint providing the remaining portion of the match. Uh, on approximately November 24th, the state will issue uh, the results of their challenge process. Uh, and so all of my numbers and maps are just a draft at this point in time. Uh, we, we submitted every address that was eligible. Uh, but it is possible for other providers to challenge those addresses on the basis of either already providing broadband service at those locations, and the threshold for broadband is 25 meg by 3 meg under the state rules, uh, or the fact that they have a plan and they have funding and contractors and permits that a bona fide plan to provide coverage to those addresses. So it's possible that this 118 uh, will be reduced by challenges filed by other providers. Um, so again, these numbers are drafts, and uh, after the state releases the results of that challenge, we'll know better. But, but even if you were to allocate a particular amount of money, um, my suggestion would be to leave that allocation static, and it will just cause there to be a higher matching percentage if the challenge reduces the number of eligible loans. So, I've covered an awful lot of material and not much time. How about I pause and we chat? Um, I, I ask a few questions to lead into some of this. Um, roughly, where are the uh, uh, locations that we're looking that uh, are eligible? Sure. Regionally. I understand in these are drafts. So I understand. Okay, I'd like to pass these maps out. Because I'll lead into another question. From sure. That. A picture is worth 118 words in this particular case, 118 addresses. They are scattered throughout the county. And the map that I'm passing out, the red line is the investment that Joint has already made in the county. Um, and the white lines are the routes that will be constructed to build the 118 eligible addresses. We've then depicted the 409 locations that I mentioned that are between zero and 100 feet from the route. And then we've depicted <coughs> the remaining 624 homes. 356 are between 101 and 200, and 268 are between 201 and 300 feet from the road. And this, uh, okay, so we're reasonably distributed out through here. Yes, I, uh, when we submitted the letters of intent, we submitted five letters of intent, one for each county in which we have fiber, and we included every address that the state provided the geographically the areas that were eligible. We then used Indiana property tax parcel data to identify improved parcels and the addresses that we believe were eligible within those areas. So at a very high percentage of confidence, I believe we've submitted every address that was eligible. It's possible we missed a few, and if we did, we will service them as well. But, but this particular round of next level, we had to submit addresses in the letter of intent phase. And so to the best of our ability, we submitted every address that was eligible in all five counties. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about the challenge, and that's an important part of this just for the, if nothing else, for the audience and the other members, because you and I have spoken about this. Several of these uh, addresses, or some of them, are in a, uh, another uh, 
provider, another applicant's existing coverage area, right? Uh, so, I believe that some of these addresses, so in the challenge database, another provider has submitted some of these same addresses in pursuit of a grant as well. Um, I think that's a bucket, and I think there is also a bucket of the challenge process. So that's right. So to be able to submit a challenge, <coughs> you have to either already be servicing the address or have funded plans to service the address. And so in that challenge process, my expectation is that some of these addresses may fall out, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what I guess I probably mis misworded some of that, but some of these addresses that you have applied for have been applied for as well by Bloomingdale Home Telephone, right. which is another provider in our county, as I think everybody in this room knows. Um, and they have applied for some of them as well. And the conversations that we've had, uh, the discussion, and even the statement that you made about making funds available but not allocating it per se, apply in this scenario because uh, they're going to be possibly seeking some help as well. Um, and we're, the state's not going to fund these addresses twice, and no. neither are we. No. Um, so, fair enough. Um, Outside of the, the you've, you've given a, an indication of, of commitment, um, I, I certainly, and I, I want to make sure that it's clear uh, to, to, your, to you and to your team. Um, the commissioners and the council worked together a couple years ago to create the infrastructure to, uh, development zone, which uh, for those of you who recall, <coughs> that exempts broadband infrastructure in Park County from property taxation in perpetuity. Uh, we granted two, two applicants to that, or two applications, one each in the last two years, um, to exempt them, which becomes a, a reasonably substantial financial commitment when you're talking about the kind of investment we're talking about here. Uh, that goes on and on. Um, I encourage Joe <coughs> to apply for that. Uh, for the investment that's been done now and any further investment, um, it is legitimately, it's not uh, wrong to do that. It's, it's more than acceptable. That's why it was created, to, to give us a leg up or a chance to help, um, you know, in, encourage investment. Um, so please, please uh, yeah. go forward with that. Um, what, else, what else can the county do? Uh, to help ease the burden and to help encourage investment uh, in this important service in our county. Well, I think you should be really proud of what you just mentioned. Cr creating a, a broadband infrastructure uh, tax abatement program is substantial. Um, certainly, we are a, a material personal property taxpayer in all of the counties in which we operate. Um, uh, we we value um, practicality. So, so the opportunity to have practical conversations to get our, to get our permit requests approved on a timely basis, uh, to, to work together and the opportunity to, uh, to install infrastructure when the rights of way are torn up as a part of another project, um, to have expedited uh, permitting and permitting approval processes um, from, from time to time. Uh, it's helped getting roads closed temporarily or with keeping areas secure and safe when we're working. Um, Park County has been very practical and very easy to work with uh, from our perspective. And so I don't know that I have any specific new, con new uh, suggestions, but I would encourage you to stay the course in the accommodating posture that, that you have provided and you continue to provide for broadband. I think that there's a real shift happening in this country where, where very talented people enjoy quality of life. And Park County has some, all of West Central Indiana, but Park County has some very nice attributes as it relates to quality of life. And the big thing that's missing um, in some areas is broadband. And yet, Bloomingdale's made a great investment. Schwenk has made a great investment. There are areas of Park County that have fantastic connectivity. Uh, but continue
continuing to work to get to where all of Park County has fantastic connectivity. I believe we'll continue to move the needle um, in the number of residents who choose to live and work here um, and, and the economic contributions they can make to your community because this allows folks to work for New York firms and Miami firms and Washington DC firms and make those wages while living in Park County and that gives them a lot more disposable income to spend in your community. And so I think you should be very proud of what you've done already. Well, you've made my point at why I've been doing this for so long. That point right there. Um, is there any other, I mean, anybody else have any questions about what? So are you guys strictly burying your fiber, or do you, have you even contemplated putting them on the electric poles, or, or do you, where, where do you stand on that? We, uh, the conventional wisdom would be, Conventional wisdom would be that the more rural you get, um, the more important it may be to go overhead. But I've built about 560 miles of fiber at this point. What I will tell you is that oftentimes the more rural you get, the fewer competing utilities there are, and the more probable it is you can drop a cable plow in the ground and plow that line underground. The other challenge with going overhead, the more and more rural that you get, is the longer it takes to get service restored uh, when the overhead lines are down from storms. Um, and so our strong preference is to, and is to invest for the longest time horizon possible. We believe this infrastructure has a 30 to 50 year useful life and it's installed underground. Uh, and our strong preference is to install it underground. So we may need to evaluate on a case by case basis utilizing overhead lines um, in, in certain areas where for whatever reason it, maybe it's hard to obtain underlying rights or right of way or, or whatnot to bury it underground, but our strong preference is, is to bury this infrastructure. That when we first started in Terre Haute, uh, we had evaluated utilizing an overhead ring, and, and I can now point to at least three occasions where that ring would have been broken in multiple places. Uh, and we enjoy, every time there are very bad storms, we enjoy showing up at work and doing what we planned to do that day not showing up at work and responding to a bunch of outages. And I think that as society becomes more and more dependent on this infrastructure, um, having higher and higher uptime is very valuable to the end user. And I believe we are able to deliver a higher uptime at joint by placement underground. Uh, so our, our preference is, is to place it underground and, and it's also to build it once. Um, so, so as long as as long as that, uh, as long as we can cash flow those economics, we're going to do everything we can to place it underground. Because I assume underground is much more expensive than overhead. Is that would that be right or not right or? It, it's so situational. Uh, we work with we work with um, industry professionals and have this conversation often. It, it really depends on who the overhead utility company is, um, and and some overhead utility companies are far more accommodating and easy to work with. Some of the larger overhead utility companies that own the poles, it, it is oftentimes cheaper to put it underground than to pay uh, all the make ready costs mm -hmm. that are associated with going overhead. And mm -hmm. So it, it, and it's not even as simple as just who the power company is. It's, it's just very, very situational. Um, and, and, um, and across the majority of Joint's territory, um, we've, we've benefited perhaps not on the installation costs, but we've benefited on the operating cost side uh, in almost every case by keeping it underground. So when, when, when your long-term goal is to remain as affordable as possible to the consumer, uh, reducing maintenance costs is a huge component of being able to keep your prices low for a long time. And, and with such an opportunity right now to seek state and federal support to build the infrastructure underground, um, with grant subsidy, our, our preference is to take advantage of that and try to keep our maintenance and operating costs for that 30, 40, 50 year time period as low as we can. Sure, sure that makes sense. Oh, you got a question? Yeah, question. <laughs> no, I really don't. Um, and just for the information of the council, there's three providers that have applied for next level connections addresses in Park County. I've heard from Joint at this point, Bloomingdale obviously was because I've mentioned that, and AT&T applied for some as well. Um, I, I spent a lot of time working with Joint this summer when they were out in my neighborhood uh, 
out uh, in um, the Nyesville and Gutson projects. Um, and top notch bunch of people that I really appreciate the, the support we've gotten from, from joint uh, the ease of working with as well. I mean, you can comment how easy it's been to work with, uh, with some of our folks, and, and they have been as well, very much so. So, thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, you know we'll take this on to the to the working group for the ARP funding, um, and then we'll go from there and see what uh, we uh, decide to do out of that. But I appreciate that. I'm, I also appreciate you mentioning Nyesville and Judson. So we Nyesville and Judson are two of the three next level Pen X projects um, here in the county, and, and they'll both be finished this year, uh, ready to service residents as they sign up. And we've deferred the Bridgeton project. Uh, into next year, we anticipate starting that in March or April timeframe and, and building bridge and all at once. So those uh, joint has an established track record of, of winning next level to next projects. We had a really high quality app, seven applications. Uh, it's a, a large number of applications by a single provider. And, uh, we executed them what we said we would do and uh, we're servicing uh, residents in Park County on those networks. We're very, very grateful for the state support and Okay. All right. Thank well, thank you. you. Appreciate you coming. And well, thank yeah. you. You're up. Okay, I just wanted to take the time to give you an update on the grants and then tell you the new grants that we got. So all the grants are going well. We should be getting money in for the, uh, the soft target protection grant. We're not complete with that, but the count should be zeroed out by December. And we're going to continue with about 70K to buy fencing for the jail. Uh, but that will be next year under that same grant. And the account will be zeroed out. You mean you will have enough the revenue be, for yeah. the money that's been spent? Yeah, so no interdepartmental loans. Um, the criminal justice grant, so we should be receiving a little over $2,000 here sometime in the next week or two, depends on when the state sends us the money. And that grant will be closed out. There'll be no more additional money coming in. So the courthouse security, where 2020, we had somebody there 40 hours a week. There's not going to be any grant money to support the county to do that. So people have to make decisions, and they'll probably go back to the 21 hours. But that ain't my thing to worry about. I'm just telling you, there's no more money coming in. Fair enough. All right. Fair enough. Um, the LEPC planning grant, so that's seven grand that's going to come in, and then that should zero out the account. So there shouldn't be any interdepartmental loans on that one. And you think the uh, criminal justice one will be in the black by the end of the year as well, right? I, I do, second. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, we're still working on the, the, the NG911 GIS one. Talking to the company, they're pretty much going to be done here in uh, December. So as we get the grants and stuff, as we get the bills, we'll pay it out. Um, but we're not going to have a problem with that because you guys put seed money in there, so that's not going to be an issue. Um, and then we were awarded two grants here recently. One was a salary reimbursement. This is an annual thing. Um, we'll we'll apply to get the reimbursement. We should get a little over eighteen thousand dollars. The next one is the uh, emergency generator for the highway department. So we got forty grand to put an emergency generator in there. We don't need any seed money. Um, and I'll start probably buying stuff and running through that on uh, in January of next year. So my recommendation is that we just do it like the way we've done the other grants where we just go negative and then I should get the reimbursement back. That's fine. As long as we don't cross the calendar, we will extend the uh, seated one today for six months next year. And so, uh, so that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for Appreciate you keeping on track on the top all in. A lot to do there. <laughs> okay, department head comments. Katie? Things are going well. We're finishing up uh, the fourth 
leg of the reassessment. Um, it'll be done this week or latest next week, and things are going well. Thank you. Jason? I have nothing unless you guys have any questions. Questions for the Sheriff's Department? When's the jail opening back up? Today. Today. Good deal. Okay. Commissioner Mace, you're on. Well, as you know, we were successful with the community property grant, 972000 there. So that would be Yay. Over, Yay. over a million bucks for the projects there. So we'll start the new Can year. I help pick the roads that are going to black off? Everybody <laughs> wants to, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll Okay. And it's always going to be wrong with everyone you well, get. Oh, yeah. So, so that's already already committed. So we'll begin the new uh, the new picking next uh, next month or so. Um, health insurance is ongoing. I met again in Avon, and I am... Um, like I said, I've been doing this about a year since we got the increase last year, but a surprise. Uh, we took their bond uh, looking around. Uh, didn't want to go to market with the same company. We looked at different companies. I had a company, a friend of mine, um, R.E. Sudden, has a Sudden Insurance in Indianapolis. Uh, he recently sold out to Brown & Brown. So that's one of the big dogs in the insurance company there. I actually out of Florida, but it's a big, big in Indiana company now, too. So been meeting with them. Uh, so we have a viable pro. Uh, Proposal from Anthem as well as one from uh, UMR through Apex. So we'll have to weigh that money. We'll, we'll be making a decision on Monday which way we're going to go. Um, difference in money, difference in it's it's just almost impossible to compare plans uh, apples to apples because there's too many too many things hiding under this rock over here, and so you've got to make sure everything's is checked, everything's covered. Typically, if we do change to go to Anthem from uh, UMR or the other way around, typically the, the biggest differences are the formularies are all changed. That's the tier levels of the different different pharmaceuticals. But typically on that, some people get hurt because they're used to paying at, uh, say, this level three, which is the, almost the free stuff. They may be moved up to two. But then there's equal number of people who get moved from been paying this amount of money to a lower amount of money. So it's usually a wash on, who gets, on the end result. The different people are affected by that sometimes. Uh, with Anthem, the PBM, that's the Pharmaceutical Benefits Manager, has to be Anthem. You can't, um, you can't go to anyone else to do that, like Express Scripts or uh, Rx. Uh, you, you can't make that change. You have to go with them, especially groups our size. So you may result with a few more dollars being spent there because you don't have all that competition in the outside world for the formulary control. But, but at the same time, you're looking at maybe $100,000 difference in costs. So those are all the things that we have to look at. So. Uh, transplants are covered in one, they're not covered in the other, they're lasered out. What a laser is, if you were talking with them, in fact, UMR say last year, uh, if you're coming in at a certain rate and that rate is high because you have one potential person who may need a procedure that's very expensive, you can cut that out of the plan, but then you have to get a separate plan just to cover that individual for that circumstance and there's added cost to that which you may or may not have to spend. But you kind of take that out when there are no lasers this time, and no lasers is better, so there's no lasers either way with Anthem or with UMR. Um, reinsurance must be with uh, Anthem. If you go with Anthem, they don't uh, take outside uh, reinsurers. Uh, Crumb Forster was our reinsurer. Um, they, uh, we, we spent about half a million, $460,000 a year for the reinsurance, which covers us um, once we get, mac get our maximum exposure met. And, um, they were looking at a 15% increase, they're projecting, which is going to be about $60,000 increase on that 460 some thousand. Uh, Apex did a very good job by taking up the market with someone else to look at that, and they got that down to $20,000, so that's about a 5% increase uh, on, the, on the insurance cost. Um, so we'll make a decision on Monday. I think we're going to be able to come in in a situation where it's not going to uh, severely impact the uh, people on the plan. And as, as you said, which I thought was a great point to make the other day, maybe maybe this year people will actually be able to uh, see some benefit from their raises. We'll all go to insurance hopefully this year, so we'll see. But you told us there's no money to spend. We have to do something to stay at, uh, at zero uh, an increase. And so the only thing you can do is change the way you do business or change benefits. And changing benefits is the last thing I personally want to do, so we're looking at other, other options. But I'll come back to you after we uh, make our decision uh, on Monday on that. Uh, the ARP meeting, uh, as you know, just to remind John and, and uh, Roy, is uh, the 16th at 6.30 in here. And we'll begin that process then of deciding uh, how we're going to spend that. Sounds like a lot of money, $3.2 million, but as you've already seen, it's not much money at all. 
Uh, if we completely support the grant request, but John just gave you talking about one or two million that was in there, that we're talking about uh, um, first responder uh, uh, benefits, uh, we're talking about just 300,000 there or so. Um, if Marshall is looking for support, which we'll be able to work out some, we'll be able to figure out how to do that. They desperately need, if that city is gonna, if that town is gonna exist, it's gonna have to have a sewer system. Just the engineering to get the PER done is about $625,000. Uh, we have to investigate how we can best do that. We can either go through a, um, Indiana funding or a, we'll, we'll figure out a way to do that. We'll be, able, we'll be able to help them do that. The trouble is, you know, you only got that small pot of money and you got so many needs. And like I told Kevin when I was talking to him last night, uh, I'm completely supportive of that. But it's hard to pick $650,000 to deal with to serve 360,000 when you use that money, say, for the internet or something else, and benefit 17,000 people in the county. So it's just it's just an impossible call. You just have to, to sit down with people involved and talk about it and see what the best way to go and then, and then go. Um, the, the tough part is picking winners and losers. That's just the tough part. And sometimes you just have to do that. You don't want to, but you just have to. Just like choosing between two uh, insurance companies. They're both viable companies, both good processes. you got two people wanting that 1.7 million dollars for uh, for just the health insurance, and uh, you got to pick one, and one wins, one loses. Um, the door restoration has begun. He's up working on one now. In fact, I just texted him here a minute ago. He's got one side of one door done, and he, he loves the way it looks. It's the, when, as you recall, the commission wanted to go with the dark uh, dark walnut, and that's the inside doors, and so that's where we're going with those. So we'll do those the one uh, one side at a time. So the east side is up there now. He's working on those. He thinks he'll have those done maybe. Uh, the end of next week, and we're paying approximately eighty dollars an hour, which is not an unreasonable amount of money to pay for someone of that skill to do. So that's what it is. It's just you know how intricate the doors are. It's going to take a long time to get them done. So again, we're looking at that a couple thousand bucks a door by the time it's done. By the time and this guy's a professional. This, this is not what he the does, and he is a handy man. That he's approved by the Indiana Historical Society, uh, Indiana um, Landmarks Society. So that's where we got his name from. So this is. The guy who's going to do this won't be nobody do any better than that. Whether we like it or not, I don't know. But we nobody. Well, will at least he's he's yeah. This is what he does. This is what he does. Is what he does. does. No, yeah. no. And so to save money, you know, we uh, have delivered the doors to him. This is shops up in Delphi, north, north of Lafayette. And so instead of having him drive down here to work on them here out in the cold stuff, that just didn't make sense at all. So um, had Don uh, Don had uh, a trailer of his modified so we could hold the doors upright, and so we delivered them. Uh, he delivered them. Um, up to uh, Lafayette, he's working on those, and we'll make the exchange then as soon as he gets these two done. We'll just continue on. So we can work on them all winter. It should be up, all good and going in the spring. I keep in mind it's just doors. That's not the outside woodwork. That'll be another project to come along later. But right now we're just working on the doors and see where we go from that. Um, I appreciate the uh, jail and Chris. The, uh, the cameras are back to the recycling bins, and that's a good thing. If you drive by and see at the old shop over there, that strange looking R2D2 thing sitting in the parking lot, that's a camera. And uh, Jason said the pictures are pretty amazing. You can get the entrances, so you can see people coming in and out as well as looking at the bins themselves. So we're good there. Heard from Matt Steckley. If you remember him, that's uh, Corp Facilities. That's the guy we've hired to uh, do the RFP work for the uh, jail uh, HVAC system, uh, the courthouse uh, alarm system, the sprinkling system, uh, the, uh, the elevator. And he's when we know that the RFPs have come in uh, and uh, he's extremely happy with the numbers we've got for the jail. So he will be presenting those to us as he, uh, as he gets those done. And I think that's all I got, unless you got questions for us. Did you get that transfer done for that? For that funding? Which, which one? For Steckley, the core facility. Um, the $48,000. Yes, yes, he was paid. Awesome, and to ask you, did you get a check sent out to Nick Brown for the doors? Yes, that thousand 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 thousand. Thousand. What that was, was uh, when he and I met to discuss this process, we had talked about a thousand dollar deposit on the sixteen thousand dollar job just for materials, and to get set up, and I understand that. So, but when he put in his invoice, it wasn't included in the invoice, so we didn't pay that. So, uh, he mentioned to Don, Don mentioned to me that, that we thought we were going to do that, and, and I agreed we had. So, I asked the auditor to go ahead and forward a thousand dollar deposit to him. So, that was Anything else? I don't believe so. Anybody else have anything for Commissioner? Okay, don't forget the uh, 16th. And uh, also, just so you'll know, too, I also intend to, to reinvigorate the cemetery commission. We got new pointies on that, so I'll get the list from the auditor of who those people are and we're going to be going. We have a gentleman uh, named Lee Creed who's 
He's a volunteer. Lee has done some pretty tremendous things for the highway department. He, uh, he's a whole patcher like I am, only he is on steroids compared to what I do. He's just uh, amazing some of the things that he's taken on to do. So uh, he is also a professional uh, cemetery restoration person. He knows how to do the stones, how to do the whole thing. So he's interested in being on that. So I suspect that we will have a meeting and get him, uh, get him going and get new people involved and we will begin to have some progress on uh, some of these uh, lost cemeteries which we have everywhere. And so we may at some point decide, may have to come back to you guys for some type of budget if there's something available to help, help the recover and save some of those. We're not talking big bucks, but just something to have so that committee that uh, uh, cemetery commission would have some funds to work with. Townships are ultimately responsible for those things. Uh, some townships have money to do that, some including line item. Roy would know better than from their budgets how many have those kind of lines and who, who don't. So we, we certainly intend to attach all of the township funds that are available, but that may or may not be sufficient to do what we need to do. So if that's the case, we'll come back and ask questions. And as you all know, there's uh, some of them that are, the townships are responsible for, and some right. of them that they aren't. Right. right. The ones that are on, that are privately owned, private land, the right. townships are not responsible for, but yep. Um, and, and which they, then kind of falls to the, the landowner in the county and so on. But we have dealt with one up, uh, well, up in Green Township. In Green Township on, uh, is that a what? One Pratt Road, road. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So I think maybe it's Pratt the responsible for that. I think he is. They named the road after me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that, that was controversial because there was just a, an unpleasant guy pushing that. But uh, we yeah. had big conversations. And, and uh, but some of us you guys just aren't aware. This is the middle of the middle of the field. You would never know it was there, but it's somebody's family. It was buried there in good faith, and and the townships are responsible for at least trying to preserve those. There was a time when the state says you don't have to preserve those. Farmers can just take up the stones, try to make a reasonable facsimile of where they were, plow it under, and be gone. Then they change their mind on that. Now you can't do that. That's going back the other way now. So. But again, that particular instance is one where the township's not responsible that's right. because the, 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 own. the landowner's paying property yeah. taxes on the yeah, land. That, and that's the determining factor who's right. paying taxes on that. When I was trustee, I cleaned up three. And great. one of them is a township cemetery. Cemetery, excuse me. It uh, It's deeded off of the property owner and so on. That one yep. clearly is yep. a responsibility of the yep. township. Yep. Uh, the second one was, the other two, one of my inherited, but from uh, uh, an association. The second one is not, it's private, but it's right out there by the road. I felt it was wise yeah. use of the township's funds. And, that's to, you, and you have that, that option. You can take right. that yeah, I can still do it. I work with the landowner. Yes, you just don't have that down. Stuart Major and Drew, they've been more than, more more than, than accommodating. accommodating to this gentleman who wanted this, he has a family up there. They even took down the... Ten rows of corn, I suppose. So we drive back there if you need to. Right in the middle. I went back there to cut weeds on it one day, but I just happened to see because corn was really tall. They got big corn; they're like ten foot tall stuff. And you just right in the middle of this field, and I just happened to see that he was spraying the corner of the field. I just happened to see the booms on top of the corn as I'm going in. Otherwise, I went around the middle of the middle of that field when he's got the spray coming in. Who knows what that would have been? But uh, they have been more than accommodating to him. They'll continue to be so. So. We'll meet, we'll meet with them. But I just want you to know we're going to get going. We need to come back from time to time. Project stuff. Work on your planning and zoning appointments before the first of the year. We are we are evaluating all boards that we have, and basically the only the only driving force for us is attendance. We need to find out who's attending, who's not attending, who's being beneficial, who's not being beneficial. I'll tell you who's not. We, and that's what we need from every. We're going to seek from every every president of every board to find out those numbers. And uh, we have to look changes. at the health board. I hope you're going to look at that. We health have board. changes in mind for the health board, exactly. Yep, we are. And uh, so uh, they're all coming up. That'll all be reviewed after January. We will get by the end of the year reports on attendance. We've asked every board to keep attendance. I think we all do. And just simply turn those into us. And it's pretty black and white. Either you've been there for 50% of them or you haven't been there for 50%. That includes CDC and everything. Every board that we appoint, we need to get those up to date and get them, get them going. So we will. Good deal. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, in your packet you have the uh, EMS monthly report. I'm not going to read it to you. It's in there for your uh, information. Chris, you want to stand up and introduce yourself? You're yes, our sir. Own, you're our only public, so you can mm -hmm. introduce yourself and say why you're here. Thank you. My name is Christian Beaver, and I'm a candidate for state senate for Park County and the other five counties in our state senate district. And I have been uh, working since... Uh, uh, September to get around the other counties and meet with elected officials and business owners, community leaders, and Republican Party leaders 
to learn about the other counties and each county's unique set of uh, challenges and their own uh, needs. So uh, thank you for uh, getting me in the lineup here this morning. I just want to come and introduce myself. Uh, I take 60, 90 seconds of your indulgence to share about why I'm running. For yeah, this just, yeah, a couple, just a couple minutes. That'd be fun. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, during my youth, I made uh, two mission trips to Thailand. And I could speak for hours about the misery that I saw uh, the day spent working in leprosy colonies with people living in squalor, uh, people so to speak from the disease that some of our team members were physically ill from what they saw, but the day spent working in orphanages with children living in abject poverty, uh, desperate to be held and hugged. On one occasion, I brought a backpack full of small toys that I filled. It cost about a dollar each. Uh, and for many of the children who got one, it was the only gift they'd ever received. I returned home from those two trips a changed person, thankful to my Christian faith for leading me there, indignant that a country with wealth would allow its people to live in that way, more sensitive to the plight of people left behind and more appreciative of an America that would help me to graduate college, raise a family with my wife and four daughters, and build a business. We live in a country and a state divided between urban and rural, minorities and whites, educated and non, haves and have-nots. Part of what divides us is that parts of Indiana, parts of our country, have been left behind. Parts of rural Indiana without cell service, without broadband, child care, uh, entire counties without a hospital or an urgent care center. Uh, small towns deserted, communities were once thriving factories stood that are no more. If we are going to again be a country with a common vision, a common purpose, and a common appreciation for the privilege to be an American, then we have to bridge that divide. That's why I'm running for the state senate. All children deserve access to schools that work, uh, where all who graduate are able to get a good job or go to college if that's a dream. All who live in rural Indiana should have access to a doctor, a hospital, uh, child care, drug-free communities that thrive. I want to work with groups like Joint to uh, bring modern technology to uh, counties like Park, technology that they need, technology that they deserve. So it's the kind of Indiana that I want, it's the kind of Indiana that we all want. So I'm Christian Beaver, I'm running for the State Senate. Thanks for having me, I look forward to answering any questions you have and being able to speak with each of you individually. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. Okay, approval of the minutes. Uh, we have June, July, August, September is not available today, and October for your approval. Motion to approve. Second. Motion been made and second. Approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Additional appropriations. Okay, we get two additionals. One for RDC operations. Um, this is uh, for the Purdue, or the county's portion of the Purdue housing study. Um, funding is in place from the sale of LAB. Uh, forfeitures and seizures, eight hundred and twenty-five dollars. I'm not familiar with the details on that one. I just know that they uh, were going to ask. I'm oh, sorry, that's uh, from the, the prosecutor's office for handling of a drug incinerator. I apologize. So, okay, that's any questions? That is what's before you. I would move approval. Second. Most been made. Second. Approve the additionals. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we're down to transfers. We have to make a, a slight correction on the back page of your agenda on the CUME capital development for the sheriff. Um, it is it's this, the number second number is should be 1180, 1138 as well instead of 1170. So mark out 1170. It's supposed to be 1138. These would be the second and third ones on the back page. Yeah, there you go. Um, on both of those. All right, Still so, 1130. Uh, there's several here for uh, EMS for certified EMT. Four of those uh, from various sources to put money into certified EMT salary lines. Uh, that's short staffing uh, and uh, use of part time and movement of funds situation. Um, there. Uh, Julie ran those past me. Uh, there's a public safety one for the EMS for ambulance vehicle maintenance. Uh, 82 cents. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll balance the books. Yeah, it's, you know, we've been through this before. Um, 
And then one for uh, in 1170 from special events and medical supplies, the tune of $2,000. Uh, legal services and the general fund to certified EMTs, $132,74. Uh, from office supplies, $40,35. There was some more that come along here. These, as you can see, are also from the general fund as persons as they came along afterwards. More math got done. Uh, there'll be a resolution to move more into this line shortly. Uh, park and rec training and travel out supplies 2171. As we talked already, the 1138 CCD ones for the sheriff from uh, supplies. Um, I the exact term of that line. Find my paper here. It doesn't matter. Uh, the seven or uh, three thousand dollars to prisoner medical and dental, and then from jail building maintenance. 11,000 to prisoner medical and dental, and then from equipment in 1170 to prisoner medical and dental um, to get their again balance in the books. So, those at all had been previously ran by me, and we talked about them and helped some of them find some of these funding sources, etc. Okay, those are what's before you on your transfer. Move to approve transfers. Second. Motion to be made and second approve transfers. All in favor? Aye. 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 Three appropriations. Uh, I don't know any of the details about these, but yeah. highway departments, yes. you do? Um, <clears throat> yes, on the highway department, the town of Rockville read the meter wrong, so it caused an overpayment, so then the town of Rockville refunded us the money. And I have a quote is that we, re that we received it back into the fund of $11,116.24. And now the highway's asking that to be reappropriated back into the regular fund. Yep. <clears throat> and the other county highway one is that the auditor's office had made an error and we paid an invoice two times one for $12,013.09. The other invoice was for $13,411.61. A grand total of $25,424.70 was refunded back in. We did receive that money back into the funds, and now we're wanting it to be reappropriated back into the budget line. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to remain second to reappropriate funds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No jury pay. Many no. reports. No RDC. Planning and zoning. Uh, we met no business before zoning. Well, the city went. Uh, Leon Bryant. They did some uh, variance on the uh, barn barn. So we can have public. Oh, public stuff. Yeah. No courthouse security meeting. Solid waste. Solid waste met their approval minutes, and they noted that. Park County talks away day. There was 316 cars that participated. Collection included a little over 24,000 pounds of tires, 10,000 pounds of appliances, 10,000 pounds of electronics, 57 pounds of medicines and sharps, and just shy of 12,000 pounds of hazardous waste. Wow, that's a lot, isn't it? Mm. Popular. Better than having in the ditch. Correct. Okay, we have ready for a new business. Yeah, let me, yeah let me talk because these numbers and stuff are uh, a little bit wrong here. Um, I'm going to ask to table the salary ordinance um, today. I plan to adopt that today um, as we adopted in our budget. Um, there is money in that from the ARP fund, and I really believe we need to run that through the working group before we completely adopt the salary ordinance. Or otherwise, if something happens there, I think we believe that that's the right thing to do. Um, I know this council does because we voted on that and we adopted that budget. But with that being said, I don't want to do the salary ordinance twice. So let's just wait. We have time to do it in December. It's not a problem. So we'll uh, punt that off uh, till then. Uh, the resolutions, um, these numbers are off. So first one is 2021-07. Okay, this is a reappropriation ordinance from the commissioner's liability insurance line 
to EMS uh, certified EMTs in the amount of $18,000. This is uh, uh, more of the money, money, money moving that we just did with transfers because there's nothing left to transfer from there. So uh, I would ask that council consider the adoption of this resolution uh, and the amount of this uh, reduction of appropriation from general commissioner to liability insurance and reappropriate that to emergency medical service certified EMT. Oh, yeah, so moved. <laughs> second. Okay, motion been made and second to approve a resolution 2021 07 reduction of appropriations. All fair? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the next one is 2021 08. This is a resolution relating to overtime pay for specific Park County public safety positions. This is a uh, communication resolution the county council does not set or uh, set the overtime policy the county commissioners do, but this is a recommendation to the county commissioners um, of what we would like for them to do and what we had agreed to in our budget to fund. Uh, I'll skip the whereas, but I will read that in pertinent lines here real quickly. Now therefore be it resolved by the Park County Council that the council recommends to the Park County Board of County Commissioners that the following positions be eligible for overtime compensation in lieu of compensatory time. Dispatchers, dispatch supervisor, jail officers, and jail officer supervisor. Further, this recommendation is contingent upon the agreement and understanding that normal staffing levels as of the date of adoption of the 2022 Park County budget, which was on October 14, 2021, shall not be increased without express permission and agreement by both the Park County Board of County Commissioners and the Park County Council. Further, the Sheriff shall, of Park County shall report to the Auditor of Park County by December 31st, 2021, the amount of compensatory hours that have been accumulated by employees in the above positions. The Auditor shall compensate these employees for their accumulated compensatory hours at the hourly rate which they would earn in calendar year 2021. The Park County Council shall ensure that the adequate funding is available to support this policy while this resolution is in effect. That's resolution 2021-08 for your consideration. Okay. Motion to pass resolution 2021-08. Second. Motion been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 2021-09. Authorizing a six-month extension of funds from the statewide 911 fund to the NG911. GIS Data Conversion Grant Fund. This is the fund that Chris talked about. This is a grant seed uh, funding, uh, an interfund loan extension into the first six months of 2022. As you're well aware, the funding will not be in by the end of the year and the county is negative. I think we've done this several times. We've right? done this several times. Yeah. Motion to approve resolution 2021-09. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Last one. And this one is another reduction of appropriations. Um, the uh, maintenance employee of the extension service has retired. Um, our 2022 budget appropriates that funding in a little, a small amount additionally to the buildings and grounds line and commissioners for the fire. Or the, the way this all always worked is the county paid it into the fair board and buildings and grounds group uh, to maintain the fairgrounds. Um, when the individual became an employee of the county, that ended. Well, that's over. That agreement that was put in place is, has terminated with his retirement. There still remains uh, $3,483.63 in that salary line that would have been due to the, to the uh, fair board. So I ask that we uh, reduce the appropriation for that maintenance line and, and uh, uh, the general fund extension service by that amount and reappropriate it to the buildings and grounds line, the commissioners, and then the fair board can file a claim for that funding. Motion to approve resolution 2021 10 is stated. Second. Most been made, segment all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Yeah. Okay. 
uh, they will, I will tell them that we have done that and then somebody from the fair board will file will ask for that funding. Okay. Yeah. Done. Okay, that's the resolutions. So we got that done. Okay. All righty, so we're going to do the health. We have a, in your packet is a letter from the health board. They've come up with a way to pay a public health nurse through a grant. You can read it for yourself. The funding opportunities become available. The board also, the health board would also like to extend the uh, hours of the clerk registrar to be increased to 29 hours beginning in the first day of January. You want to add anything? Well, you went to the meeting. I went to the meeting. Um, the, the funding for the nurse is a, uh, it's a state grant going out to these county health departments where they, uh, ex it's a school liaison role. A uh, big chunk of it is, and there's data reporting and so on. But the expectation of the health board um, and how it was explained is that the nurse could do both of these positions. Um, the, the funding requirements for this grant are relatively loose other than you have to have this school liaison and you have to file these reports and what else you do with the money is really to some extent they don't care. Um, so th the proposal that we finished with was that the nurse would be paid from that grant entirely. Uh, it's $110,000 first year. Um, there it poss very possibly comes another $110,000 give or take some. Uh, next year, so you would be talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars over the period of that, which would last for you know, better part of four years, funding the nurse um, at this proposal. Uh, they also asked, they wanted to, to, you could use this to increase the hours of the health registrar or whatever as well, and I, I really didn't want to get into, into doing that, um, but they are into paying more per hour or anything did agree to the consideration of making that a 29 hour job for next year um, that keeps it still part time and at the same hourly rate and that funding could come from the, the two the funds that pay for the nurse and the registrar now um, but we won't be paying out money to the nurse out of health and local health maintenance so I felt like it was a reasonable proposal to get the grant um, then it's it's fine. We do not have to do anything with this today, but um, other than, you know, if we want to give it our blessing, uh, I think we could wait and probably give it our blessing in December, but I think it's probably a good thing to go ahead and get it done if we are supportive of what they want to do. Does anybody have any objections to that? Or, I mean, it seems like kind of a no-brainer. I do, we do want to state clearly that this is not an enforcement officer. I, I, and, and I we was need to make sure that that even goes into the minutes. That this, the nurse is not to be an enforcement officer. That was a, a, a. I'm glad you brought that up because that was something that I, I quizzed them down very, very hard about in that meeting. Was this school liaison is simply a resource to the schools. It's not a tattletale, and it's not an enforcement officer for anything that these schools are doing. They're big kids. They have their own. Have yeah, their own corporation, uh, their own corporation, and all this stuff to deal with. The nurse is simply there, or this individual is simply there to assist them um, in what they need. So that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Fill out reports that they've done. Okay. So we can give that our blessing if you all are inclined. If you want to think, if you need time to think about it, well, that's fine too. We can deal with great. it in December. I mean, I'd I think say, it's I'd say go ahead. fairly well thought out. Yeah. Now, why don't you just make somebody make a motion that, we, that we are in favor of their. Motion. I would make the motion to, to, uh, to uh, approve the recommendation of uh, the health department and the letter received or dated October 29, 2021. I'll second it. Okay, motion made. Second in all favor. Aye. Uh, nice. <laughs> all right. We'll deal with the details of that later. So, uh, you do have a letter from the town of Marshall asking for ARP funds, which will be referred to the working group. We're not going to, we're not equipped really to deal with that here, so you have it in your packet. Mm -hmm. You've uh, heard the details of that, and you've got the letter, so. Yeah. 
Uh, also in your packet is the proposed uh, meeting schedule for next year. That needs to be overhauled. These number, these dates over here all say 21. Oh, sorry about so that. So that needs to be fixed. November sorry still says that. Friday as well. No. Yeah, November still says Friday as well. Yeah, Thursday. So, so that all needs to be overhauled. Okay. We'll adopt the actual uh, schedule in uh, January, so it's just in there. Uh, we did get receive our notice from the state. Our budget was approved. Our 1780 no, 1782 notice came in. Um, congratulations to Roy for. I mean, it, we have no changes. It's been signed, sent back. Great. You want to? You want to add color? Uh, you know, he he said that we uh, the uh, budget itself was approved as submitted, with the exception of that they knocked that back because I sent it in high. I'm curious to see what they do with that. Um, and they put it back the right word would be. Um, the levies were approved as submitted, except in debt, which we sent in high intentionally, uh, and the general fund, which is always sent in high, because that catches whatever rounding errors that you end up with in this. Um, CCD was lowered, and that's due to the, the cumulative fund calculations. Uh, the AV growth was up, so it knocked it back up from 0.033 to 0.032. Standard process that goes on with those. Um, the calculator that I used to, to set these levies predicted the general fund levy to the dollar. So um, or it, it works. We we're in sixty-six dollars of the max we levy. Left six, within sixty-six dollars of the max levy, and that's uh, because they will only run a rate out to four decimal places. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> hey, Howard. Yeah. Please go in the refrigerator. Yeah, there you go. Tell me about it. Okay, I'd like to set, we always set a, a year-end meeting in December in case we need it. I mean, it's always my plan that we won't have to have it, but I like to have it already set in case something comes up at the last minute that we need to need to do. And I'm proposing on Tuesday the 28th uh, of December, 9 o'clock. Anybody have a problem with that? All I need is four. We don't don't feel like you need to come necessarily as long as we have four of us, because it, it'll be something very minor. It's not going to be any be a last minute transfer, a last minute transfer or, or something that we have to deal with. So we'll set that. Hopefully, the newspaper can help us out with that. Mm -hmm. So it'll be 9 a.m. December 28th. If you want to just have it here, you want to have it, you just, just have it here. Mm -hmm. okay. You won't have to pour all your office. So we'll have that. Mentioned the budget. Is there anything else that we're talking about? Sure. I, so. I, got my probably. I did hear from the State Board of Accounts. Our audit is about done. They expect to be here for just to wrap up a few things in the next week or so, and they, they will be finally finished with it. So. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Yeah.